Astounding Stories, 6, June 1930. Out of the Dreadful Depths by C. D. Willard. Robert Thorpe reached languidly for a cigarette and with lazy fingers extracted a lighter from his pocket. Be a sport, he repeated to the gray-haired man across the table. Be a sport, Admiral, and send me across on a destroyer. Never been on a destroyer except in port. It would be a new experience. Enjoy it a lot. In the palm-shaded veranda of this clubhouse in Manila, Admiral Struthers, U.S.N., regarded with undisguised disfavor the young man in the wicker chair. He looked at the deep chest and the broad shoulders, which even a loose white coat could not conceal, at the short, wavy brown hair and the slow, friendly smile on the face below. A likable chap, this Thorpe, but lazy, just an idler, he had concluded. Been playing around Manila for the last two months, resting up, he had said. And from what? the Admiral had questioned disdainfully. Admiral Struthers did not like indolent young men, but it would have saved him money if he had really got an answer to his question and had learned just why and how Robert Thorpe had earned a vacation. You, on a destroyer, he said, and the lips beneath the close-cut gray mustache twisted into a smile. That would be too rough an experience for you, I am afraid, Thorpe. Destroyers pitch about quite a bit, you know. He included in his smile the destroyer captain and the young lady who completed their party. The young lady had a charming and saucy smile and knew it. She used it in reply to the admiral's remark. I have asked Mr. Thorpe to go on the Adelaide, she said. We shall be leaving in another month, but Robert tells me he has other plans. Worse and worse, was the admiral's comment. Your father's yacht is not even as steady as a destroyer. Now, I would suggest a nice comfortable liner. Robert Thorpe did not miss the official glances of amusement, but his calm complacence was unruffled. No, he said, I don't just fancy liners. Fact is, I have been thinking of sailing across to the States alone. The admiral's smile increased to a short laugh. I would make a bet you wouldn't get fifty miles from Manila Harbor. The younger man crushed his cigarette slowly into the tray. How much of a bet, he asked. What will you bet that I don't sail alone from here to... Where are you stationed? San Diego? From here to San Diego? Humph, was the snorted reply. I would bet a thousand dollars on that and take your money for Miss Allaire's pet charity. Now that's an idea, said Thorpe. He reached for a checkbook in his inner pocket and began to write. In case I lose, he explained, I might be hard to find, so I will just ask Miss Allaire to hold this check for me. You can do the same. He handed the check to the girl. Winner gets his thousand back, Ruth. Loser's money goes to any little orphans you happen to fancy. You're not serious, protested the admiral. Sure. The bank will take that check seriously, I promise you. And I saw just the sloop I want for the trip had my eye on her for the past month. But Robert, began Ruth Allaire, you don't mean to risk your life on a foolish bet. Thorpe reached over to pat tenderly the hand that held his check. I'm glad if you care, he said, and there was an undertone of seriousness beneath his raillery, but save your sympathy for the Admiral. The U.S. Navy can't bluff me. He rose more briskly from his chair. Thorpe, said Admiral Struthers. He was thinking deeply, trying to recollect. Robert Thorpe. I have a book by someone of that name, Travel and Adventure, Knocking About the World. Young man, are you THE Robert Thorpe? Why, yes, if you wish to put it that way, agreed the other. He waved lightly to the girl as he moved away. I must be running along, he said, and get that boat. See you all in San Diego. The first rays of the sun touched with golden fingers the tops of the lazy swells of the Pacific. Here and there a wave broke to spray under the steady wind and become a shower of molten metal. And in the boat, whose sails caught now and then the touch of the morning, Robert Thorpe stirred himself and rose sleepily to his feet. Out of the snug cabin at this first hint of day, he looked first at the compass and checked his course, then made sure of the lashing about the helm. The steady trade winds had borne him on through the night, and he nodded with satisfaction as he prepared to lower his lights. He was reaching for a line as the little craft hung for an instant on the top of a wave and in that instant his eyes caught a marking of white on the dim waters ahead. Breakers! he shouted aloud, and leaped for the lashed wheel. He swung off to leeward and eased a bit on the main sheet, then lashed the wheel again to hold on the new course. 
again from a wave crest he stared from under a sheltering hand the breakers were there the smooth swells were foaming breaking in mid-ocean where his chart he knew showed water a mile deep beyond the white line was a three-master her sails shivering in the breeze the big sailing ship swung off on a new tack as he watched was she dodging those breakers he wondered then he stared in amazement through the growing light at the unbroken swells where the white line had been he rubbed his sleepy eyes with a savage hand and stared again there were no breakers the sea was an even expanse of heaving water i could swear i saw them he told himself but forgot this perplexing occurrence and the still more perplexing maneuvers of the sailing ship this steady wind for smooth handling was all that such a craft could ask yet here was this old timer of the sea with a full spread of canvas booming and cracking as the ship jibbed she rolled far over as he watched recovered and tore off on a long sweeping circle the one-man crew of the little sloop should have been preparing breakfast as he had for many mornings past but instead he swung his little craft into the wind and watched for near an hour the erratic rushes and shivering haltings of the larger ship but long before this time had passed thorpe knew he was observing the aimless maneuvers of an unmanned vessel and he watched his chance for a closer inspection the three master mini r from the dingy painting of the stern hung quivering in the wind when he boarded her there was a broken log line that swept down from the stern and he caught this and made his own boat fast then watching his chance he drew close and went overboard the line in his hand like a blooming native after coconuts he told himself as he went up the side but he made it and pulled himself over the rail as the ship drew off on another tack thorpe looked quickly about the deserted deck ahoy there he shouted but the straining of rope and spars was his only answer canvas was whipping to ribbons sheets cracked their frayed ends like lashes as the boom swung wildly but a few sails still held and caught the air he was on the after deck and he leaped first for the wheel that was kicking and whirling with the swing of the rudder a glance at the canvas that still drew and he set her on a course with a few steadying pulls there was rope lying about and he lashed the wheel with a quick turn or two and watched the ship steady down to a smooth slicing of the waves from the west and only then did the man take time to quiet his panting breath and look about him in the unnatural quiet of this strangely deserted deck he shouted again and walked to a companionway to repeat the hail only an echo sounding hollowly from below replied to break the vast silence it was puzzling inconceivable thorpe looked about him to note the lifeboat snug and undisturbed in their places no sign there of an abandonment of the boat but abandoned she was as the silence told only too plainly and thorpe as he went below had an uncanny feeling of the crew's presence as if they had been there walked where he walked shouted and laughed a matter of a brief hour or two before the door of the captain's cabin was burst in hanging drunkenly from one hinge the log book was open there were papers on a rude desk the bunk was empty where the blankets had been thrown hurriedly aside thorpe could almost see the skipper of this mystery ship leaping frantically from his bed at some sudden call or commotion a chair was smashed and broken and the man who examined it curiously wiped from his hands a disgusting slime that was smeared stickily on the splintered fragments there was a fetid stench within his nostrils and he passed up further examination of this room forward in the fossicle he felt again irresistibly the recent presence of the crew and again he found silence and emptiness and a disorder that told of a fear-stricken flight the odor that sickened and nauseated the exploring man was everywhere he was glad to gain the freedom of the wind-swept deck and rid his lungs of the vile breath within the vessel he stood silent and bewildered there was not a living soul aboard the ship no sign of life he started suddenly a moaning whimpering cry came from forward on the deck thorpe leaped across a disorder of tangled rope to race toward the bow he stopped short at sight of a battered cage again the moaning came to him there was something that still lived on board the ill-fated ship he drew closer to see a great huddled furry mass that crouched and cowered in a corner of the cage a huge ape thorpe concluded and it moaned and whimpered absurdly like a human in abject fear had this been the terror that drove the men into the sea had this ape escaped and menaced the officers and crew thorpe dismissed the thought he well knew was absurd 
the stout wood bars of the cage were broken it had been partially crushed and the chain that held it to the deck was extended to its full length too much for me the man said slowly aloud entirely too much for me but i can't sail this old hooker alone i'll have to get out and let her drift he removed completely one of the splintered bars from the broken cage i've got to leave you old fellow he told the cowering animal but i'll give you the run of the ship he went below once more and came quickly back with the log book and papers from the captain's room he tied these in a tight wrapping of oilcloth from the galley and hung them at his belt he took the wheel again and brought the cumbersome craft slowly into the wind the bare mast of his own sloop was bobbing alongside as he went down the line and swam over to her fending off from the wallowing hulk he cut the line and his small craft slipped slowly astern as the big vessel fell off in the wind and drew lumberingly away on its unguided course she vanished into the clear-cut horizon before the watching man ceased his staring and pricked a point upon his chart that he estimated was his position and he watched vainly for some sign of life on the heaving waters as he set his sloop back on his easterly course it was a sun-tanned young man who walked with brisk strides into the office of admiral struthers the gold-striped arm of the uniformed man was extended in quick greeting made it did you he exclaimed congratulations all okay thorpe agreed ship and log are ready for your verification talk sense said the officer have any trouble or excitement or perhaps you are more interested in collecting a certain bet than you are in discussing the trip damn the bet said the young man fervently and that's just what i am here for to talk about the trip there were some little incidents that may interest you he painted for the admiral in brief terse sentences the picture of that daybreak on the pacific the line of breakers white in the vanishing night the abandoned ship beyond cracking her canvas to tatters in the freshening breeze and he told of his boarding her and of what he had found where was this asked the officer and thorpe gave his position as he had checked it i reported the derelict to a passing steamer that same day he added but the admiral was calling for a chart he spread it on the desk before him and placed the tip of a pencil in the center of an unbroken expanse breakers you said he questioned why there are hundreds of fathoms here mr thorpe i know it thorpe agreed but i saw them a stretch of white water for an eighth of a mile i know it's impossible but true but forget that item for a time admiral look at this he opened a briefcase and took out a log book and some other papers the log of the mini r he explained briefly nothing in it but routine entries up to that morning and then nothing at all abandoned mused the admiral and they did not take the boat there have been other instances never explained see if this helps any suggested thorpe and handed the other two sheets of paper they were in the captain's cabin he added admiral struthers glanced at them then settled back in his chair dated september fourth he said that would have been the day previous to the time you found her the writing was plain in a careful well-formed hand he cleared his throat and read aloud written by jeremiah wilkins of salem massachusetts master of the mini r bound from shanghai to san pedro i have sailed the seas for forty years and for the first time i am afraid i hope i may destroy this paper when the lights of san pedro are safe in sight but i am writing here what it would shame me to set down in the ship's log though i know there are stranger happenings on the face of the waters than man has ever seen or has lived to tell all this day i have been filled with fear i have been watched i have felt it as surely as if a devil out of hell stood beside me with his eyes fastened on mine the men have felt it too they have been frightened at nothing and have tried to conceal it as i have done and the animals a shark has followed us for days it is gone today the cats we have three aboard have howled horribly and have hidden themselves in the cargo down below the mate is bringing a big monkey to be sold in los angeles an orang outang he calls it it has been an ugly brute shaking at the bars of its cage and showing its ugly teeth ever since we left port but today it is crouched in a corner of its cage and will not stir even for food the poor beast is in mortal terror all this is more like the wandering talk of an old woman muttering in a corner by the fireside of witches and the like than it is like a truthful account set down by jeremiah wilkins and now that i have written it i see there is nothing to tell nothing but the shameful account of my fear of some horror beyond my knowing 
and now that it is written i am tempted to destroy no i will wait and now what is this admiral struthers interrupted his reading to ask he turned the paper to read a coarse slanting scrawl at the bottom of the page the eyes the eyes they are everywhere above us god help the writing trailed off in a straggling line the lips beneath the trim gray mustache drew themselves into a hard line it was a moment before admiral struthers raised his eyes to meet those of robert thorpe you found this in the captain's cabin he asked yes and the captain was gone bloodstains no but the door had been burst off its hinges there had been a struggle without a doubt the officer mused for a minute or two did they go aboard another vessel he pondered abandon ship open the sea cocks sink it for the insurance he was trying vainly to find some answer to the problem some explanation that would not impose too great a strain upon his own reason i have reported to the owners said thorpe the mini r was not heavily insured the admiral ruffled some papers on his desk to find a report there has been another he told thorpe a tramp freighter is listed as missing she was last reported due east of the position you give she was coming this way must have come through about the same water he caught himself abruptly thorpe sensed that an admiral of the navy must not lend too credulous an ear to impossible stories you've had an interesting experience mr thorpe he said most interesting probably a derelict is the answer some hull just afloat we will send out a general warning he handed the loose papers and the log book to the younger man this stuff is rubbish he stated with emphasis captain wilkins held his command a year or so too long you will do nothing about it thorpe asked in astonishment i said i would warn all shipping there is nothing more to be done i think there is thorpe's gray eyes were steady as he regarded the man at the desk i intend to run it down there have been other such instances as you said never explained i mean to find the answer admiral struthers smiled indulgently always another excitement he said you'll be writing another book i expect i shall look forward to reading it but just what are you going to do i'm going to the island said thorpe quietly i am going to charter a small ship of some sort and i am going out there and camp on that spot in the hope of seeing those eyes and what is behind them i am leaving tonight admiral struthers leaned back to indulge in a hearty laugh i refused you a passage on a destroyer once he said and it was an expensive mistake i don't make the same mistake twice now i am going to offer you a trip the bennington is leaving today on a cruise to manila i'll hold her an extra hour or two if you would like to go she can drop you at honolulu or wherever you say lieutenant commander brent is in command you remember him in manila of course fine thorpe responded i'll be there and he added as he took the admiral's hand if i didn't object to betting on a sure thing i would make you a little proposition i would bet any money that you would give your shirt to go along i never bet either said admiral struthers on a sure loss now get out of here you young troubleshooter and let the navy get to work his eyes were twinkling as he waved the young man out thorpe found himself comfortably fixed on the bennington brent her commander was a fine example of the aggressive young chaps that the destroyer fleet breeds and he liked to play cribbage thorpe found they were pegging away industriously the sixth night out when the first s o s reached them a message was placed before the commander he read it and tossed it to thorpe as he rose from his chair s o s said the radio sheet nagasaki maru twenty four thirty five north one five eight west struck something unknown down at the bow may need help please stand by captain brent had left the room a moment later and the quiver and tremble of the bennington told thorpe they were running full speed for the position of the stricken ship but twenty four thirty five north he mused and less than two degrees west of where the poor old mini r got hers i wonder i wonder we will be there in four hours said captain brent on his return hope she lasts but what have they struck out there derelict probably though she should have had admiral struthers as warning robert thorpe made no reply other than wait here a minute brent i have something to show you he had not told the officer of his mission nor of his experience but he did so now and he placed before him the wildly improbable statement of the late captain wilkins something is there surmised captain brent just a wash probably no superstructure visible your mini r hit the same thing something is there thorpe agreed i wish i knew what 
"'This stuff has got to you, has it?' asked Brent, as he returned the papers of Captain Wilkins. He was quite evidently amused at the thought. "'You weren't on the ship,' said Thorpe simply. "'There was nothing to see, nothing to tell, but I know.' He followed Brent to the wireless room. "'Can you get the Nagasaki?' Brent asked. "'They know we are coming, sir,' said the operator. "'We seem to be the only one anywhere near.' He handed the captain another message. "'Something odd about that,' he said." USS Bennington, the captain read aloud. We are still afloat, on even keel now but low in water, no water coming in. Engines full speed ahead, but we make no headway, apparently aground, Nagasaki Maru. But that's impossible, Brett exclaimed, impatiently. What kind of foolishness? He left the question uncompleted. The radio man was writing rapidly. Some message was coming at top speed. Both Brent and Thorpe leaned over the man's shoulder as to read as he wrote. Bennington help, the pencil was writing. Sinking fast, decks almost awash, we are being. In breathless silence, they watched the pencil poise above the paper while the operator listened tensely to the silent night. Again his ear received the wild jumble of dots and dashes sent by a frenzied hand in that far-off room. His pencil automatically set down the words, Help, help! It wrote before Tharp's spellbound gaze, The eyes, the eyes, it is attack. And again the black night held only the rush and roar of torn waters where the destroyer raced quivering through the darkness. The message, as the waiting men well knew, would never be completed. A derelict, Robert Thorpe exclaimed with unconscious scorn. But Captain Brent was already at the communication tube. Chief, Captain Brent, give her everything you've got. Drive Bennington faster than she ever went before. The slim ship was a quivering lance of steel that threw itself through foaming waters that shot with an endless roaring surge of speed toward that distant point in the heaving waste of the Pacific, and that seemed to the two silent men on the bridge to put the dragging miles behind them so slowly, so slowly. Let me see those papers, said Captain Brent, finally. He read them in silence. Then, the eyes, he said, the eyes. That is what this other poor devil said. My God, Thorpe, what is it? What can it be? We're not all insane. I don't know what I expected to find, said Thorpe slowly. I had thought of many things, each wilder than the next. This Captain Wilkins said the eyes were above him. I had visions of some sky monster. I had even thought of some strange aircraft from out in space, perhaps, with round lights like eyes. I've pictured impossibilities, but now... "'Yes,' the other questioned. "'Now?' "'There were tales in olden times of the Kraken,' suggested Thorpe. "'The Kraken?' the captain scoffed. "'A mythical monster of the sea. "'Why, that was just a fable.' "'True,' was the quiet reply. "'That was just a fable. "'And one of the things I have learned is how frequently there is a basis of fact underlying a fable. "'And, for that matter, how can we know there is no such monster, "'some relic of a Mesozoic species supposed to be extinct?' He stood motionless, staring far out ahead into the dark. And Brent, too, was silent. They seemed to try with unaided eyes to penetrate the dark miles ahead and see what their sane minds refused to accept. It was still dark when the searchlight's sweeping beam picked up the black hull and broad red-striped funnels of the Nagasaki Maru. She was riding high in the water, and her big bulk rolled and wallowed in the trough of the great swells. The Bennington swept in a swift circle about the helpless hulk, while the lights played incessantly upon her decks. And the watching eye strained vainly for some signal, to betoken life, for some sign that their mad race had not been quite vain. Her engines had been shut down, there was no steerage way for the Nagasaki Maru, and from all they could see, there were no human hands to drag at the levers of her waiting engines, nor to twirl with sure touch the deserted helm. The Nagasaki Maru was abandoned. The lights held steadily upon her as the Bennington came alongside, and a boat was swung out smartly in its davits. But Thorpe knew he was not alone in his wild surmise as to the cause of the catastrophe. "'Throw your lights around the water occasionally,' Brent ordered. "'Let me know if you see anything.' "'Yes, sir,' said the man at the searchlight. "'I will report if I spot any survivor or boats.' "'Report anything you see,' said Commander Brent curtly. "'You go aboard if you want to,' he suggested Thorpe. "'I will stay here and be ready if you need help.' Thorpe nodded with approval as the small boat pulled away in the dark, for there was activity apparent on the destroyer not warranted by a mere rescue at sea. 
gun crews rushed to their stations the tarpaulin covers were off the guns and their slender lengths gleamed where they covered the course of the boat brent is ready thorpe admitted for anything they found the iron ladder against the ship's side and a sailor sprang for it and made his way aboard thorpe was not the last to set foot on deck and he shuddered involuntarily at the eerie silence he knew awaited them it was the mini r over again as he expected but with a difference the sailing vessel before he boarded it had been for some time exposed to the sun while the nagasaki maru had not and here there were slimy trails still wet on the decks he went first to the wireless room he must know the final answer to that interrupted message and he found it in the emptiness no radio man was waiting him there nor even a body to show the loser of an unequal battle but there was blood on the door jamb where a body the man's body thorpe was sure had been smashed against the wood a wisp of black hair in the blood gave its mute evidence of the hopeless fight and the slime like the trails on the deck smeared with odorous vileness the whole room thorpe went again to the deck and as on the other ship he breathed deeply to rid his lungs and nostrils of the abhorrent stench the ensign in charge of the boarding party approached what kind of rotten mess is this he demanded the ship is filthy and not a soul on board not a man of them officers or crew and the boats are all here it's absolutely amazing isn't it no thorpe told him about what we expected what do you make of this he touched with his foot a broad trail that shone wet in the bennington's light the lord knows said the ensign in wonder it's all over and smells like a rotten dead fish well we will be going back sir he called to a petty officer to round up the men and the boat was brought alongside their return to the bennington again through a pathway of light that thorpe knew was safe under the black muzzles of the destroyer's guns or was it he asked himself safe was anything safe from this devilish mystery that could pluck each cowering human from the lowest depths of the steel freighter that could drag her down in the water till the radio man sent his cry we are sinking he told brett quietly after the ensign had reported of the struggles in the wireless room and its few remaining traces and he watched with the commander through the hour of darkness while the bennington steamed in slow circles about the abandoned hulk while her searchlights played endlessly over the empty waters and the men at the guns cast wondering glances at their skipper who ordered such strange procedure when no danger was there with daylight the scene lost its sense of mysterious threat and thorpe was eager to return to the abandoned ship i might find something he said some trace or indication of what we have to fight i must leave said commander brent oh i'm coming back never fear he added at the look of dismay on thorpe's face the thought of leaving this mystery unsolved was more than that young seeker after adventure could accept i'm coming back brent repeated i've been in communication with the admiral honolulu has relayed the messages through i'll code of course we mustn't alarm the whole pacific with our nightmares the old man says to stick around and get the low down on this damn thing then why leave objected thorpe because i am coming around to your way of thinking thorpe because i am as certain as can be that we have a monster of some sort to deal with and because i haven't any depth charges i want to run up to the supply station at honolulu and get a couple of ash cans of tnt to lay on top of the brute if we sight him glory be said thorpe fervently that sounds like business go and get your eggs and perhaps we can feed them to this devil raw and i think i'll stay here if you will be back by dark better not the other objected but thorpe overruled him this thing attacks in the dark he said i will lay a bet on that it left the orang otang on the mini r quit at the first sign of daylight i will be safe through the day and besides the beast has gutted this ship it won't return i imagine and if i stay there for the day live as they lived the men who manned that ship i may have some information that will be of help when you get back but for heaven's sake brent don't stop to pick any flowers on the way it's your funeral said brent not too cheerfully the old man said to give you every assistance and perhaps that includes helping you commit suicide but robert thorpe only laughed as commander brent gave his orders for a small boat to be lowered a ship's lantern and rockets for night signals were taken at the officer's orders we'll be back before dark he said but take these as a precaution one favor thorpe asked that the ship's carpenter go over with him and help him to make a strong barred retreat of the wireless cabin and i'll talk to you occasionally he told brent i tried the key while i was aboard the wireless is working on its batteries he waved a cheery good-bye as the small boat pulled away and hurry back he called 
The destroyer commander nodded in emphatic assent. On board the Nagasaki Maru, Thorpe directed the carpenter and his helpers in the work he wanted done. The man seemed to know instinctively where to put his hands on needed supplies, and the result was a virtual cage of strong oak bars enclosing the wireless room, and braces of oak to bar the single door. Thorpe was not assuming any bravado in his feeling of safety, but he was doing what he had done in many other tight corners, and he prepared his defenses in advance. These included weapons of offense as well. As the boat with the destroyer's men pulled back to the Bennington, he placed in easy reach in a corner of the room a heavy, calibered rifle he had taken from his belongings. And, still with all his feeling of security, there was a strange depression fell upon him when the Bennington's narrow hull was small upon the horizon, and then that, too, was gone, and only the heaving swells and the wallowing hulk were his companions. Only these? He shivered slightly as he thought of that unseen watcher with the devil eyes, whose presence Captain Wilkins had felt, and his men, and the poor terrified ape. He deliberately put from his mind the thought of this. No use to start the day with morbid fears. He went below to examine the cabins, but he carried the heavy elephant gun with him wherever he went. Below decks the signs of the marauder were everywhere, yet there was little to be learned. The slimy trails dried quickly and vanished, but not before Thorpe had traced them to the uttermost depths of the ship. There was not a nook or corner that had gone unsearched in the horrible quest for human food, and one thing impressed itself forcibly upon the man's mind. He found a lantern, and he used it of necessity in his explorations, but this thing had gone through the dark, and with unerring certainty had found its way to every victim. "'Can it see in the dark?' Thorpe questioned. "'Or?' He visioned dimly some denizen of the vast depths, living beyond the limits of the sun's penetration, far in the abysmal darkness where its only light must be self-made. But his mind failed in the attempt to picture what manner of horror this thing might be. Even in the hold its evil traces were found. There were tiers of metal drums that still shone wet in his lantern's light. Calcium carbide, for making acetylene, he supposed, marked made in the USA. The Nagasaki must have been westward bound. He went, after an hour or so, to the wireless room, and only when he relaxed in the safety of his improvised fortress did he realize how tense had been every nerve and muscle throughout his long search. He tried the wireless and got an instant response from the destroyer. Don't shoot it too fast, he spelled out slowly to the distant operator. I am only a dub. Just wanted to say hello and report all okay. Fine, was the steady, careful response. We have had a little trouble with our condensers. There was a short pause, then the message continued, this portion dictated by the commander. Delay not important. We will be back as agreed. Have picked up SS Adelaide bound east in your latitude. Warned her to take northerly course account derelict. See you later. Signed Brent, commanding USS Bennington. The man in the barred room tapped off his acknowledgment and closed the key. He suddenly realized he had had no breakfast, and the hours had been slipping past. He took his gun again and went down to the galley to prepare some coffee. It was not the time or place for an enjoyable meal, but he would have relished it more had he not pictured the Adelaide and her lovely owner steaming across these threatening seas. He knew the captain of the Adelaide, obstinate pig-headed old Scotchman. Hope he takes Brent's advice. Of course, Brent couldn't tell him the truth. We can't blat this wild yarn all over the air, or the passenger lines would have our scalps. But I wish the Adelaide was safe in Manila. His explorations in the afternoon were half-hearted and perfunctory. There was nothing more to be learned. But he had seen in his mind some vague outline of what they must meet. He saw a something, mammoth huge, that could grasp and hold an ocean freighter, against whose great body he had seen the waves dash in a line of white spray. Yet a something that could force its way down narrow passages, could press with terrific strength on bolted doors, and crush them inward, wrecked and splintered. Some serpentine thing that felt and saw its way, and crawled so surely through the dark, found its prey, seized it, and carried off a man as easily as it might a mouse. No octopus, no matter what proportions, filled the description. He gave up trying to see too clearly the awful thing, and he kept away from the ship's rail when once he had ventured near. For there had come to him a feeling of fear that had set waves of cold trickling and prickling up his spine. Was there something really there? A waiting, lurking horror in the depths? The eyes, he thought, the eyes. And he went more quickly than he knew to his barred retreat where again he might breathe quietly. 
The position of the deserted ship was south of the regular steamer lanes on the Trans-Pacific run. Only a trace of smoke in the northern horizon marked through the afternoon the passage of another craft. It was a long and lonely vigil for the waiting man, but the Bennington would return, and he listened in at intervals, hoping to hear her friendly signal. The batteries operating the Nagasaki's wireless were none too strong. Thorpe saved their strength, though he tried at times to raise the Bennington somewhere beyond his reach. The sun was touching the horizon when he got his first response. "'Keep up the old nerve,' admonished the slow, careful sending of the Bennington's operator. "'We have been delayed, but we are on our way,' signed Brent." The man in the wireless room placed the oak bars across the door and tried to believe he was nonchalant and unafraid as he laid out extra clips of cartridges, but his eyes persisted in following the sinking sun, and he watched from within his cage the coming of the quick dark. The protecting glare of day must be unbearable to this monster from the lightless depths, and daylight was vanishing. Thorpe's mind was searching for additional means of defense. He found it in the cargo he had seen, the drums of carbide. He could scatter it on the deck. It reacted with water, and those slimy arms, if they came and touched it, could find the contact hot. He took his lantern and went hastily below to stagger back with a drum upon his shoulder. In the half-light that was left him, he forced the cover and then rolled the drum about the swaying deck. The gray, earthly lumps of carbide formed erratic lines. Useless, perhaps, he admitted, but the threatening dark forced the man to use every means at his command. He was scattering the contents of a second drum when he stiffened abruptly to rigid attention. The ship, thrown broadside to the wide space swells, had rolled endlessly with a monotonous motion. But now the deck beneath him was steadying. It assumed an abnormal levelness. The boat rose and fell with the waves, but it no longer rolled. There was something beneath, holding, drawing on it. Thorpe knew, in that frozen second, what it meant. The drum clattered to the rail as he dashed for his room. Gun in hand, he watched with staring eyes where the deserted deck showed dim and vague in the light of the stars, and the bow of the ship was lost in the uncertain dark of night. Wide-eyed, he watched into the blackness, and he listened with desperate attention for some slightest sound beyond the splashing of waves and the creaking of spars. Far in the west a light appeared, to glow and vanish and glow again in the tumbling waters. The Bennington. His heart leaped at the thought, then sank as he knew the destroyer's lights would not appear from that direction. Through a slow hour that seemed an eternity, the oncoming ship drew near, and he knew with a sudden startling certainty that it was the Adelaide and Ruth Allaire coming on into the horror awaiting. He leaned forward tensely as a sound reached his ears, a ghostly echo of a sound like the softest of smooth, slipping fabric upon hard steel. And as he listened, before his staring eyes, something came between him and the lighted yacht. It wavered and swung in the darkness. It was formless, uncertain of outline, and it swung in the night out beyond the ship's rail till it suddenly neared, waved high overhead, and the cold light of the stars shone in pale reflection from an enormous staring eye. It surmounted a serpentine form that took shape in the dim radiance without, and came lower in undulating folds to crash heavily upon the deck. Thorpe's hand was upon the wireless key. He had wanted to warn off the yacht, but not till the thud of the creature on the bare deck proved its reality could he force his cold fingers to press the key. Then, fast as his inexperience allowed, he called frantically for the Adelaide. He spelled her name over and over. Would the sleepy operator never answer? The Bennington broke in one. Is that you, Thorpe? What is up? they demanded. But Thorpe kept up his slow spelling of the yacht's name. He must get a warning to them. Then he realized that the Bennington could do it better. Bennington, he called, Adelaide approaching. I am attacked. Warn them off. Warn them. His frantic hissing dots and dashes died immediately. Beneath his feet, the Nagasaki Maru was rolling again, swinging free to the lift and thrust of the swells beneath. Good God, he shouted aloud in his lonely cabin. It's gone for the yacht. Adelaide, turn north, full speed. He clicked off on a slow, stuttering key. Head north, you are being attacked. He groaned again as he saw the Adelaide's shining port swing away from the safety of the north. The ship broached broadside to the waves and came slowly to a stop. Bennington, he radioed. Brent, it has got the Adelaide. Help, hurry, I am going over. He tore wildly at the barred door, and he made a dash across the deck to slip sprawling in a heap against the rail where the slimy traces of the recent visitor stretched glistening on the deck. 
how he lowered the boat thorpe never knew but he knew that there was one that the men from the bennington had swung over the side and tore madly at the tackle to let the boat crash miraculously upright into the sea he slung the rifle about his neck with a rope end there were cartridges in his pocket and he went down the dangling lines and cast off in a frenzy of haste what could he do he hardly dared form the question only this stood clear and unanswerable in his mind the yacht was in the monster's grip and ruth allaire was there on board ruth allaire so smiling so friendly so lovable food for that horror from the depths he rode with superhuman strength to drive the heavy boat across the wave-swept distance that separated them between gasping breaths he turned at times to glance over his shoulder and correct his course and now as he drew near he saw though indistinct the unmistakable snake-like weaving of horrible tenuous fingers rolling and groping about the yacht they were plain as he drew alongside the trim ship rose and fell with the water while over her side where thorpe approached swung a long white monstrous rope of flesh it retreated like the lash of a whip and the horrified watcher saw as it went the struggling figure of a man in the grasp of flabby lips and above them a single eye glared wickedly another vile twisting arm rose from the after deck with a screaming figure in its grasp and vanished into the water beyond the yacht there were others writhing about the decks thorpe saw them as he made his boat fast and clambered aboard a wave of reeking air enveloped him as he reached the deck the nauseous stench from the monster's tentacles was horrible beyond endurance he gagged and choked as the stifling breath entered his lungs a huge rope of slippery throbbing flesh stretched its twisted length toward the stern it contracted as he watched into bulging muscular rings and withdrew from the after deck the deadly end of it stopped in mid-air not twenty feet from where he stood the jaw-like pincers on it held the limp form of an officer in its sucking grip while above in a protuberance like a gnarled horn a great eye glared into thorpe's with devilish hatred the beak opened sharply to drop its unconscious burden upon the deck and the watching man petrified with horror saw within the gaping maw great sucking discs and beyond them a brilliant glow the whole cavernous pit was aflame with phosphorescent light dimly he knew that this light explained the ability of the beastly arms to grope so surely in the dark the eye narrowed as the gaping fleshy jaws distended and robert thorpe in a flash that galvanized him to action was aware his fight for life was on he fired blindly from the hip and the recoil of the heavy gun almost tore it from his hands but he knew he had aimed true and the toothless seeking jaws whipped in agony back into the sea there were other arms whose eyes were searching the stern of the yacht thorpe plunged frenziedly down a companionway for the cabin he knew was ruth allaire's was he in time could he save her if he found her his mind was in a turmoil of half-formed plans as he rushed madly down the corridor to find the body of the girl a limp huddle across the threshold of her cabin she was alive he knew it as he swung her soft body across one shoulder and staggered with his burden up the stairs if only he could breathe his throat was tight and strangling with the reeking putrescence in the air and before his eyes was a picture of the strong oak bars of his own retreat somehow some way he must get back to the abandoned ship an eye detected him as he came on deck and he dropped the limp body of the girl at his feet as he swung his rifle toward the glowing light within the opening jaws the sucking discs cupped and wrinkled in dread readiness in the fleshy toothless opening he emptied the magazine into the head though he knew this was only a feeler and a feeder for a still more horrible mouth in the monstrous body that rose and fell tremendously in the dark waters beyond but it was typical of robert thorpe that even in the horror and frenzy of the moment he rammed another clip of cartridges into his rifle before he stooped to again raise the prostrate figure of ruth allaire the forward deck for the moment was clear it rose high with the weight of the writhing twisting arms that weighed down the stern of the yacht where the crew had taken refuge to think of helping them was worse than folly he dismissed the thought as another great eye came over the rail once more he used the gun then lowered the girl to the waiting boat and cast off and rowed with the stealthiest of strokes into the dark behind him were whipping points of light above the white brilliance of the yacht adelaide the boat was tossing in great waves that came from beyond where a body incredibly huge was tearing the waters to foam 
there were ghostly arms that shone in slimy wetness that lashed searchingly in all directions as the monster gave vent to its fury at thorpe's attack there were screaming human figures grasped in many of the jaws and the man was glad with a great thankfulness that the girl's stupor could save her from the frightful sight he dared to row now and his breath was coming in great choking sobs of sheer exhaustion when at last he pulled the senseless form of ruth allaire to the deck of the nagasaki and drew her within the frail shelter of the wireless room stout had the oaken bars appeared and safe his refuge in the barricaded room but that was before he had seen in horrible reality the fearful fury of this monster from the deep he placed the braces against the door and turned with hopeless haste to seize the wireless key bennington he called and the answer came strong and clear where are you help his fingers froze upon the key and the answering message in his ears was unheeded as he watched across the water the destruction of the yacht this craft that had dared to resist the onset of the brute to fight against it to wound it was feeling the full fury of the monster's rage the gleaming lights of the doomed ship were waving lines that swept to and fro in the grip of those monstrous arms the boat beneath thorpe's feet was tossing in the wave that told of the titanic struggle he had meant to look south for some sign of the oncoming destroyer but in fearful fascination he stared spellbound where the mass of the trim yacht swept downward into the waves where the green of her starboard lantern glowed faintly for an instant then vanished to leave only the darkness and the starlit sea a voice aroused him from his stupefaction where am i where am i ruth allaire was asking in a frightened whisper that terrible thing she shuddered violently as memory returned to show again the horror she had witnessed where are we robert and the adelaide where is it thorpe turned slowly the insane turmoil of the past hour had numbed his brain stunned him the adelaide he mumbled and groped fumblingly for coherent thoughts he stared at the girl she was half risen from the floor where he had laid her and the sight of her quivering face brought reason again to his mind he knelt tenderly beside her and raised her in his arms where is the yacht she repeated the adelaide gone thorpe told her lost a thought struck him was your father on board ruth ruth was dazed lost she repeated the adelaide lost no she added in bladed response to thorpe's question daddy was not there but the men captain mcpherson that horrible monster she buried her face in her hands as she realized what thorpe's silence meant he held the trembling figure close as the girl whispered where are we robert are we safe we may win through yet he told her through grim set lips he realized abruptly that he was seeing the face of ruth allaire in the light he had left a lantern burning he withdrew his arms from about her and sprang quickly to his feet to put out the tell-tale light in darkness and quiet was their only safety and he knew as he sprang that he had waited too long a soft body crashed heavily on the deck outside the girl's voice was shrill with terror as she began a question thorpe's hand pressed upon her lips in the dark where he stood waiting waiting a luminous something was glowing outside the cabin it searched and prodded about the deserted deck to whip upward at the audible hiss of wet carbide another appeared the rifle came slowly to the man's shoulder as a pair of jaws gaped glowingly beyond the windows and an eye stared unblinkingly from its horn-like sheath it crashed madly against the walls of the wireless room to shatter the glass and make kindling of the woodwork of the sash thorpe fired once and again before the specter vanished and he knew with sickening certainty that the wounds were only messages to some central brain that would send other ravening tentacles against them but the oak bars had held he reached in the brief interval for the key and he sent out one final call for help he strained his ears against the headset for some friendly human word of hope rocket the wireless man was saying fire rockets we can't find a swift writhing arm wrapped crushingly about the cabin as the message ceased thorpe seized his rifle and fired into the gray mass that bulged with terrible muscular contractions through the window he fired again to aim lengthways of the arm and inflict as damaging a wound as his weapon would permit the arm relaxed but a score of others took up the attack 
again the sickening stench was about them as gaping jaws gleamed fiery beneath the hateful eyes and tore at the flimsy structure thorpe jammed more cartridges into the gun and fired again and again then dropped the weapon to fumble for the rockets that brent had given him he lighted one with trembling fingers the first ball shot straight into a waiting mouth another ignited a searing flame of acetylene gas where a wet arm writhed in the hot carbide trail the man leaned far out through the broken window no time to look around he let the red flare stream upward high into the air then dropped the rocket hissing on the deck to seize once more the rifle a mass of muscle crashed against the door it went to splinters under the impact and only the two oak bars remained to hold in check the horrible tentacles and darting heads one mouth closed to a pointed end that forced its way between the bars the oak gave under the strain as robert thorpe pulled vainly at an empty gun beside him rose shrieks of terror as the monstrous thing came on and thorpe beat with frantic fury with his clubbed rifle at the fleshy snout he knew as he swung the weapon that the shrieks had ceased then smiled grimly in the numbing horror as he realized that ruth allaire was beside him a piece of oak was in her hands and she was striking with desperate and silent fury at the slimy flesh it was the end thorpe knew and suddenly he was glad the nightmare was over and the end was coming with this girl beside him but robert thorpe was fighting on to the last and he tried to make his blows reach outward toward the hateful devilish eye he saw it plainly now for the deck was a glare of white light he saw the eye and the thick arm behind it and the score of others that made a heaving knotted mass were brilliant and wetly shining he could see now how best to strike and he turned his gun to thrust with the barrel at the eye it withdrew before his stroke the jaw slid backward to the deck there were sounds that hammered at his ears the guns the guns a girl was screaming across the deck where searchlight played huge arms were lashing backward toward the sea the waves beyond had vanished where a monstrous body shone wetly black in a blinding glare and the man hung panting helpless on the one remaining bar across the doorway to look where beyond her forward guns a spitting stream of staccato flashes the bennington tore the waves to high thrown spray her four clean funnels swung far over as the slim ship with her stabbing crashing guns swung in a sweeping circle to bear down upon the black bulk slowly sinking in the searchlight's glare the vast body had vanished as the destroyer shot like one of her own projectiles over the spot where the beast had lain and then where she had passed the sea arose in a heaving mound the big ship beneath the watching man shuddered again as another depth charge grumbled its challenge to the master of the deeps the warship went careening on an arc to return and throw the full glare of her searchlights on the scene they lighted a vast sea strangely stilled an oily smoothness leveled waves and ironed them out to show more clearly the convulsions of a torn mass that rose slowly into sight thorpe in some way found himself outside the cabin and he knew that the girl was again beside him as he stared and stared at what the waters held a bloated serpent form beyond believing was struggling in the greasy swell its waving tentacles again were flung aloft in impotent fury and beneath them where their thick ends jointed the body a head with one horrible eye rose into the air a thick-lipped mouth gaped open and a gleam of molars shone white in the blinding glare the twisting body shuddered throughout its vast bulk and the waving arms and futile staring eyes dropped helpless into the splashing sea again the revolting head was raised as the destroyer sent a rain of shells into its fearful mass once more the oily seas were calm they closed over the whirling vortex where a denizen of the lightless depths was returning to those distant subterranean caverns returning as food for what other voracious monsters might still exist the man's arm was about the figure of the girl trembling anew in a fresh reaction from the horror they had escaped when a small boat drew alongside they're safe a hoarse voice bellowed back to the destroyer and a man came monkey wise up a rope where thorpe had launched his boat and now as one in a dream thorpe allowed the girl to be taken from him to be lowered into the waiting boat he clambered down himself and in silence was rowed across to the destroyer thank god said brent as he met them at the rail you're safe old man and miss allaire both of you you let off that rocket just in time we couldn't pick you up with our light and now he added we're going back 
back to san diego the admiral wants a word of mouth report thorpe stilled him with a heavy gesture give ruth an opiate he said dully let her forget forget good god can we ever forget he stumbled forward heedless of brent's arms across his shoulders as the surgeon took the girl in charge admiral struthers u s n leaned back from his desk and blew a cloud of smoke thoughtfully toward the ceiling he looked silently from thorpe to commander brent if either one of you had come to me with such a report he said finally i would have found it incredible i would have thought you were entirely insane or trying some wild hoax i wish it were a damn lie said thorpe quietly i wish i didn't have to believe it there were new lines about the young old eyes lines that spoke what the lips would not confess of sleepless nights and the impress of a picture he could not erase well we have kept it out of the papers said the admiral said it was a derelict and the wild messages floating about were from an inexperienced man frightened and irresponsible bad advertising very for the passenger lines quite commander brent agreed but of course mr thorpe may want to use this in his next book of travel he has earned the right without a doubt no said thorpe emphatically no i told you brent that there was often a factual basis for fables remember well we have proved that but sometimes it is best to leave the fables just fables i think you will agree a light step sounded in the corridor beyond nothing of this to miss allaire he said sharply the men rose as ruth allaire entered the room we were just speaking said the admiral with an engaging smile beneath his close-cut moustache of the matter of a bet mr thorpe has won handily and he has taught me a lesson he took a checkbook from his desk what charity would you like to name miss allaire that was left to you you remember some seaman's home said ruth allaire gravely you will know best if you two are really serious about that silly bet that bet my dear said robert thorpe with smiling eyes was very serious and it has had most serious consequences he turned to the waiting men and extended a hand in farewell we are going to europe ruth and i he told them just rambling around a bit our honeymoon you know look us up if you're cruising out that way End of Out of the Dreadful Depths 